So uh, I, I, I was tasked with a talk of, of giving a talk about uh, spine surgery decompression techniques today. So we're going to talk a little about about, uh, you know, kind of one of the facets of what we have to do as spine surgeons is uh, we unpinch pinch nerves. We stabilize unstable spines, we correct deformities and we stabilize uh, uh, instability. So basically, this is one facet of what we do. And I'm going to talk about some of the techniques, some of the principles I, I told Greg. This is my talk on how not to tear the dura on the wrong side at the wrong level. So that's the talk today. So we're going to talk about decompressing nerves and, and, and how we do that and how I do it. And you guys are more than welcome to chime in with how you do it as well. And, and this is I try to make these interactive, so uh, feel free to chime in. So let me do this here. OK, so uh, what when we're. Unpinching pinch nerves when we're decompressing the neural elements uh, for our pathologies. Uh, what are the causes? Well, primarily what we're going to see is we get we get neural impingement from degenerative changes, most commonly spinal stenosis. Uh, my MRI uh, picture shows a synovial cyst, uh, which is an arthritic uh, uh, ganglion cyst that forms off of the facet joints usually that can cause compression. Our, our conditions of instability and deformity can cause uh, neural compression. Spondylolisthesis often causes a foraminal stenosis or narrowing because of the shifting of position of the spine in relationship to uh, the, the different vertebra, then creating narrowing of the exiting foramen. Uh, you can have acute structural change or trauma. So uh, a disc herniation would be something that would be acute or, or a spinal fracture uh, where the bone and the, the, the soft tissues potentially have compressed the nerves. And then other things that we see, not, uh, not infrequently, unfortunately, are neoplasm and infection. So what are the principles? Well, um, when we do direct decompression, we're going to go un decompress the spinal el neural elements. Uh, there are similar principles that we're going to apply for anything that we do from the back. So a laminectomy is a removal of the entire back arch of the spine or the lamina. A laminotomy is essentially an opening in that same structure to make room for a nerve leaving or preserving more of the normal uh, bony anatomy and ligamentous anatomy. And then foraminotomies can be done to decompress the exiting holes for the nerve, uh, all using different techniques. But the principle is the same. You're trying to create more room for the exiting neural structure or the traversing neural structure uh, during the process. Um, and you're going to basically use similar principles regardless of what anatomic area we're working at. So cervical, thoracic, and lumbar, um, they have we have different anatomic issues and different biomechanical issues, which will dictate what we can and can't do in each area. And I'll go a little bit over. Uh, some of the principles and some of the techniques we use based on where we're working as well. So the pathology essentially dictates the technique that we're going to use. Um, so if we've got central spinal stenosis, uh, we've got inability to not preserve, and I'm going to you know, see if my guys, can you see my cursor as I move it around? Mm, yes. Okay, good. So basically facet joints, um, when you're doing a decompression, ideally you want to preserve greater than 50% of the facet joint you're working at um, in order to maintain stability of the segment. So studies have shown that if you take more than 50%, you can create iatrogenic instability. So when you need to decompress the spinal canal centrally, uh, a laminectomy is kind of the gold standard operative intervention for decompressing the central spinal canal, whether it's in the cervical spine, thoracic spine, or lumbar spine. So standard removal of the entire back arch or a strategic component of the back arch of the spine or the lamina for central decompression. Compression. If we need uh, kind of unfettered access to the neural structures, the dura, the underlying nerve roots, or the spinal cord, a laminectomy gives us that midline uh, approach to be able then to work in the, the, the dural space or the epidural space to remove tumor or uh, bone fragments from a fracture, uh, infection to decompress a, 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 uh, an infection in the spine, epidural abscess. Uh, and then when we have somebody that unfortunately would present with a cauda equina syndrome, you want to maximize the amount of decompression uh, that you're going to create for an acute neurologic dysfunction from uh, uh, lumbar nerve root compression or conus medullaris compression. Uh, so you're going to do basically a wide decompression, but you still the goal is still to preserve greater than 50% of the facet joints. Uh, I, I use a laminectomy now primarily when I'm working in the upper lumbar spine, thoracic spine or cervical spine. I will tend to do more laminotomy procedures down in the lower lumbar spine because I think they preserve the anatomy better, but still the goal is to preserve greater than 50% of the facet joints. Uh, you're going to use a laminectomy when you have a congenitally narrow canal, and then upper lumbar and thoracolumbar junction. Uh, generally, I use a, a full laminectomy to take 
take care of uh, compression in those areas. We now have the ability to uh, do a laminotomy to decompress neural structures for uh, disc herniations, uh, synovial cysts, and then we can do these bilaterally for central stenosis, generally in the lower lumbar spine, typically uh, from L2 down or L3 down, depending on the patient's anatomy. Again, the goal is you got to preserve more than 50% of the facet joint. Uh, uh, these uh, diagrams here basically show the a tubular kind of approach uh, where the yellow and the green uh, cylinders represent essentially a, a tube to be able to look at the uh, the posterior spinal elements to be able to get access for decompression. Uh, again, facet joint preservation is key when you're doing this. You got to preserve the facet joint to uh, minimize risk of iatrogenic instability, and you're able to decompress the spine typically from a single-sided approach. Although you can uh, you can place the the approach or the tube on uh, bilaterally when you're doing this to decompress from a bilateral approach. Uh, the angle of the cylinder allows you to, to then potentially reach across the spinal canal towards the midline, and the lower diagram shows the red dotted lines, essentially showing uh, access across the midline to be able to de decompress centrally from a unilateral approach. So this is a novel way to do uh, a spinal decompression using a single-sided approach uh, to get bilateral spinal canal decompression, it preserves the muscles on the other side, um, and there's variations and different retractors to be able to do that type of work. So surgical approach principles, let's get it right before you start patient positioning. Um, you want to pay, you got to, to do a posterior decompression. You want to uh, patient, uh, or I'm sorry, position your patient prone. You got to pad the pressure points. Um, the image here uh, on the left shows a uh, Wilson frame, which essentially places the lumbar spine uh, and to a certain degree, the thoracic spine into flexion, which essentially opens up the interlaminar spaces which theoretically can make decompression a little bit easier because it's giving you a little bit easier access to the, the inner laminar spaces to do your work. Um, and so um, uh, the standard uh, Jackson table hall frame positioning places the spine into lordosis, which essentially uh, closes down the inner laminar spaces. You can decompress the neural structures in this way, but if you're, and you can do this when you're doing a spinal fusion because this is the position you want to have the patient in when you're uh, fusing the spine. You do not want to be fusing your patients in flexion like this. Uh, it creates uh, kyphosis and flat back syndrome, so this is a bad way to do a fusion. But either, either way is reasonable, and you can do it from either way. But if you're just doing a primary decompression, some degree of flexion is a good idea. The, the bottom left is not a good way to position your patient for a lumbar decompression. And then, you know, so, so some days you're just having a bad day, like the, the picture on the right. Um, <clears throat> The, the one thing you also want to do is make sure when you've got the patient's position, their abdomen's hanging free um, because you will minimize your intraoperative uh, uh, blood loss because the increased pressure within the abdomen then increases the epidural pressure and you can get a ton of epidural bleeding and not know why you're getting it and really not be able to visualize the field well. And in these micro decompressions, having a bloodless field is, in my opinion, absolutely critical. You've got to be able to see what you're doing, especially when you get in the epidural space. And if the epidural space or your wound is constantly filling up with blood, it makes your injury, your risk of injury to the neural structures uh, higher. It makes your uh, risk of doing an incomplete decompression higher. So again, keeping the abdomen free and minimizing the intra-abdominal pressure while you're doing your decompression is key. Uh, you've got to have the right lighting, and then uh, you've got to make sure your microscope is working before you start. It's really frustrating. If you're using a microscope, uh, then you, you want to make sure your microscope is functional before you start and that your assistant is uh, the, the visuals are positioned so that they can come in from the right position to be able to see what you're seeing. Uh, it's really hard to do a decompression when you realize in the middle of the operation when you're playing to use a microscope that the microscope's not set up right. So again, things you need to do before you start, check your lights, check to make sure the patient's positioned correctly, and then make sure that your visual tools are actively working before you start. So but again, another thing before you start, you want to make sure you're going to be operating at the right level. Um, it's, it's very frustrating to do a very good decompression and then realize at the end of the case, or even worse, after you've finished and sent the patient up to the floor or home, that you've decompressed the patient at the wrong level and they wonder and you wonder why their symptoms have not gotten better. So localization of a level, if you're doing a single, even multi-level surgery, you got to make sure you're doing the correct levels for decompression. Um, so I, I use a spinal needle. So if I'm doing a single level, decompression for this synovial cyst. You're going to see the x-ray, uh, the image of the fluoroscopy on the, the um, left, which shows me with the spinal needle. This is before I cut skin. I'll place this at a pro where I approximate the level that I want to work. 
I try and target it uh, so that it's uh, uh, in the inner spinous space, which is going to be slightly below the disc space. I, I start my, med my needle at the midline and then aim towards the contralateral facet if I'm doing a unilateral decompression. You do not want to place the needle in the inner laminar space. That creates a um, CSF leak before you even start. If that needle gets placed in the inner laminar space, so I try and aim it away from the inner laminar space, but still deep enough to be able to see it on a lateral X-ray or fluoroscopy, so you know where you're going to target your incision. And then I do a, a localizing X-ray once I place my retractor, and I still use a, a very narrow tailor retractor rather than a tube. This seems to work well for me. I, I do an inner laminar exposure, come subperiosteal uh, along the lamina, and then place my narrow tailor out over the facet. So I'm essentially working through a a small tube, although there it's it's an open tube, but uh, essentially the, the the narrow tailors allow me to do that in a tube like fashion through a relatively small incision, about two centimeters. And then I will take an x-ray before I start to confirm that my tailor is positioned exactly where I want it to be. In this case, at the facet joint directly below the disc base at L45, which tells me that I'm at the correct inner laminar and inner spinous space. Again, I use subperiostic exposure of the inner laminar space. I want to be able to see the lamina above the, where I'm working. I want to be able to see the lamina below where I'm working, and I want to see the medial facet, at least the medial facet joint, because that is my inner laminar space where I'm going to be working. So, and, and I, I at my last point in this slide is recheck the imaging as many times as needed to confirm your level. In other words, you got to make sure you are where you are and you're working where you want to be, and don't stop doing fluoros or X-ray shots until you're you know that you're in the right spot. And sometimes for me, that means that I will have done my decompression. I will then place a Woodson out the exiting foramen or around the pedicle. Let's say I'm doing four or five. I will place it or, or through the inner lamina space that I've just made, the laminotomy I've just made. I'll place it or hook it around the pedicle of L5 if that's where I'm working. And then I'll bring fluoro back in and I'll confirm that I've decompressed the level that I wanted to decompress because in a patient with a degenerative scoliosis where you're doing a decompression, sometimes the actual lateral position of your retractor uh, and your spinal needle can be off a little bit and you think you're doing the right level, but you're not. So by all means, if you if there's any question in your mind that you may be at the wrong level or may not be exactly where you want to be, confirm that's where you are and then confirm that's where you were. My surgical technique, everybody does is probably a little, a little differently, but I think the, the basics are the same. You've got to give yourself the ability to see in your work area. So you've got to expose the area you're working. Uh, I use a cob elevator to pull the muscle off the bone, do a subperiosteal exposure. I expose enough of the lamina above and below, uh, whether I'm doing a laminectomy or laminotomy, because the, the, the laminectomy would be a bilateral version of this exact approach here on the on the left. But essentially, I need to see where I'm working. So I got to basically control the bleeding like I, like I talked about. It's impossible to see in these little holes. If there's too much bleeding, you just can't see. You got to make sure your visual quarter is good, good for scope, or, or if you're going to do it with your eyeballs and, a, and loops and a light, then you need to be able to see down to where you're working. Uh, and then uh, you want to make sure that your retractor is stably positioned. If it's constantly kicking into your field, you have an increased risk of either losing where you are or neural, neural structure injury or dural injury while you're doing your procedure. So you got to make sure once you're there, you're, you are going to be stably there so you can then do the work to decompress the neural elements. Again, back to visualization, how much bone do you need to remove? I was just having this conversation with Amber in the OR. The answer is I never know exactly how much bone I need to take because everybody's pathology is a little different. Uh, an overgrown inner laminar space, an overgrown facet joint, uh, overgrown and uh, significantly hypertrophic ligamentum flavum when you're doing a decompression sometimes requires more extensive decompression work for the bone. So you take as much as you need. There are some visual landmarks uh, inside that you're going to be looking at, I, I generally will remove on a laminotomy technique, which is the upper left corner. I'm going to remove enough, enough of the uh, inferior lamina so that I can see the underlying attachment and detach where the ligament and flavum comes in and attaches on the undersurface. Once I remove enough bone to see the undersurface attachment and detach the ligament and flavum, typically I'm at a point in the in the in the pathology where there is stenosis or no compression where I have enough access above so that there should not be generally neural compression above the level of the facet joint. So you got to kind of get above where your superior facet uh, articulation is going to be internally within the spinal canal. Uh, so that's typical of my superior decompression. My inferior decompression is dependent on the pathology of the ligament. It's dependent on the pathology of the bone and the facet overgrowth. 
but I generally will take my inferior decompression low enough and lateral enough so that I can palpate and with a, either a curette or the kerosene, uh, the medial wall of the inferior pedicle. Then I know I'm lateral enough so that I can see the dural edge and typically the traversing nerve root, which is really important if you're gonna be doing disc herniation surgery, you gotta get yourself far enough lateral so that you can see lateral to the dural edge, laterally to the traversing root, because you need to be able to retract those structures medially to be able to take away the offending pathology of the disc herniation. And the synovial cyst is the same because it's compressing dorsally, but you still got to get superior to it, lateral to it, uh, medial to it, and inferior to it in order to be able to access it safely to get it out and off of the neural structures. So you got to take enough bone to visualize the pathology, access the pathology, decompress adequately. And you want to, and again, I do this to minimize my risk of complications. So if I can't see, then I'm, I'm have a higher risk of injuring the dura or injuring the neural structures. Uh, so I, I, I will take more bone if I need to, because I want to be able to see what I'm doing. How do I do that? Uh, there's a bunch of different ways. There, there is no right answer for how. I still thank Bob for showing me this diamond burr many years ago, uh, because it has become my go-to uh, bony decompression tool. Uh, it cauterizes because it runs at a higher RPM. Essentially, this diamond burr is a grinding to tool. So it runs at a higher RPM, becomes relatively hot. Uh, and then it cauterizes bone as you're removing bone. So if you use it correctly, it's very efficient at creating the openings that you need to see uh, to do the neural uh, decompression work bony wise. Uh, and it's not sharp, so it can run against the ligamentum. I leave the ligamentum flavum in because it protects the underlying dura and neural structures. There are some nuances. When this thing gets really hot, it can burn a hole in the dura. This burns a nice round hole in it. So you've got to be careful and know where you are with the tip of this. But once you get facile with it, it becomes a very good tool for removing bone. And a cutting burr works fine as well. It just tends to bleed more, so you've got to do more um, uh, cautery control and bone wax or hemosorb into the bone and control the bony bleeding with a cutting burr. And sometimes for a really hard bone uh, or certain uh, very significant calcifications in the lateral recess, uh, essentially uh, a side cutting uh, neural precision burr which is essentially uh, the, um, the basically side cutting burr is very nice to be able to remove um, uh, bone as well. Uh, again, we talked about I talked about the thermal durotomy. Uh, it can actually the other thing you got to be worried about this hot this uh, diamond burr is if you sit it on the drape, it can burn a hole right through the drape and you'll lose sterility of the tip of the burr. And then you have to be constantly suctioning while you're working because it actually creates a smoke. And so it's like working in a fog if you're not sucking it out. Um, you have to push harder with the diamond burr because it's not an aggressive burr. Um, and so you can lose control of the tip if you're not careful how you control it. And then it creates a ton of bone debris that can clog the suction. So we're constantly changing our suction. So some of those are some of the issues with it. But I think it's a very good tool for uh, removing bone and decompressing the underlying neural structures. And that is my go-to uh, uh, tip. Uh, again, these are the um, other tips that are available. This is a cutting. This is a more coarse diamond. This is the precision. This is actually an end cutting, but there's a side cutting version of this. Uh, and then this is a real aggressive cutting burr. And then you have a kerosene punch, right? So you're basically using the, the kerosene to remove bone uh, in conjunction with my burr. Once I've done the majority of my burring, I'll use my kerosene to then finish uh, my laminotomy or my laminectomy. Uh, to really get uh, make sure I'm, I'm in the place I want to be and have access to the underlying structures. Uh, it's got a the foot is designed to protect the underlying neural structure or vascular structures. You've got to create a safe plane for this to work. You can't just push this into the spinal canal. If the dura, dura is adhesed to the underlying bone or ligament and you just go in with the kerosen punch, you will inadvertently uh, uh, cut a nice hole in the uh, dura as well. Uh, I use the angled curette uh, or a Woodson to separate the, the plane before I use the punch. I want to create a plane with a tool before I use the tool so that I'm using it safely uh, as I'm doing my nerve decom uh, neuro neurologic decompression. Uh, finally, once I've done all my bony work, my kerosene's done its work, I've made the room for it. Um, I will then remove the ligament and flavum and expose the dura. So in the typical uh, tubular approach or, or unilateral approach, I've, I've done my laminectomy or my laminotomy. I've left, I typically leave my ligament and flavum in place. It is essentially laying over the dura. Sometimes it heaves to the dura. Sometimes it's containing the synovial cysts that I'm trying to decompress. Uh, the synovial cysts are contiguous generally with the facet capsules. 
They're also then contiguous with the underlying ligament and flavum because that's also contiguous with the facet capsule. And so I leave that till I get last. And so if I've done good bony decompression work, I've detached the ligament and flavum superiorly. Sometimes I've detached it laterally and then also detached it inferiorly. So now I can reflect it off the underlying dura. You, you guys, as if you've worked with me, you've seen, I, and I've got, used Dr. Thorne's technique for this. Uh, I'll use a Woodson elevator. I'll flip it into the undersurface of the ligament and flavum directly over the dura, make sure I have a safe space to work. And then I will incise the ligament and flavum directly on the Woodson elevator and then gently reflect the ligament and flavum away from the dura. And I push the, you know, I work the, the underlying surface of the ligamentum is generally smooth. I push all of the connective tissue that's still there, the adventitial tissue that's still there over the dura towards the dura, I leave that in. I, I, I think it, you have a lower risk of injuring the dura if you just push everything towards it and leave as much of the protective structures there as you can as you remove stuff away from it. And sometimes when you're doing this step, literally the dura and the ligamentum flavum and there's calcification sometimes within the ligamentum and it's all contiguous and you just got to work very tediously with with to separate things and i will actually leave a very thin film of the ligamentum flavum if i have a, a synovial cyst or something that's very adherent i'll, I'll work inside the ligamentum flavum i'll just make a little plane I'll, I'll create a plane inside the ligamentum and i'll just leave that attached to the dura and if need be i'll leave it there it, it doesn't matter to me that I've left a little adhesive part of the ligamentum or the soft tissue directly on the dura as long as it's no longer compressive. It's kind of like the float back when you do a cervical corpectomy and you're just going to leave that 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 midline structure just on the dura, but you know it's not compressive because you've released all around it. Same principle applies when you're doing a, a micro decompression or a regular decompression in the lumbar spine or thoracic spine. If something's stuck, you can spend you know 10 minutes working around it to leave it stuck to the dura or you can spend 30 minutes to an hour repairing the dura it's your choice i generally pick, pick the former rather than the latter because I, I just don't like clear fluid on my wound so um i want to as i talk about the the decompression um when i do my lateral recess decompression and really try to get out to my medial pedicle wall i talk a lot about the superior articular process and the inferior articular process so part of my decompression I work through the the inferior articular process is generally more superficial, uh, more dorsal. I work through that first, and then I see the underlying medial edge, and and it's it's more it's deeper, it's more ventral. The superior articular process edge, I generally have to remove a part, part of that so that I can see the lateral recess, see the traversing neural elements, and I will use a small curette to to separate the bone edges from the ligament to separate laterally. And then I talked about the Woodson elevator technique to remove the the ligament and flavum. Um, so what are some tips on that? Um, uh, we talked a little bit about this. Uh, remove enough lamina and facet to see the tip, the top of the superior articular process. I, I, I take enough, let's say I'm doing L4-5, I remove enough of the lamina of L4 inferiorly so that I can see laterally to the very top of the superior articular process if possible in that medial edge within the lateral recess. I try and visualize that because I want to resect that. That tells me that's where my exiting foramen is. The superior articular process generally goes into the, uh, the exiting foramen. So that would be where the L4 nerve and the L4-5 uh, um, illustration uh, lives, uh, essentially right up in here at uh, 0 0.6. That's the superior part of the uh, uh, superior articular process. I will try and resect a part of that, one, to do a good foraminal decompression there if I can, but also to visualize laterally. Um, I, I put in here, beware of the calcified ligament and flavum. When, you, when you're working, it, it seems like sometimes when the, the ligamentum is calcified, you basically have no inner laminar space. And you're trying to figure out why is there no ligamentum flavum here? It's all it's all seems to be bony edge. Well, it's not. There's actually calcification within the ligament. And the CT shows that this is a calcified ligamentum flavum. So when you're working in here, you think you should be working in this plane, but you really need to be here to decompress the neural elements. This is your true, your, the dura is the next structure down. This can be stuck. You be very adhesive and you just got to recognize sometimes this is so stuck and so adhesed that you got to basically decompress around and then leave it just attached to the dura um, uh, and, and debulk it as much as you can so it's not compressive. Um, I go to the medial pedicle wall of the inferior vertebra. Um, I push the epidural soft tissue off the undersurface of the ligament. Um, and then when in doubt, confirm your safe plane with your curette or pen field before you remove tissue. So again, we're creating that edge to work safely with the kerosene to work safely with the burr, to work safely with the curette, um, to make sure you're you're not going to injure the underlying dura or neural structures. Um, 
So basically, uh, this is a discectomy. Um, once you bone your ligament, your cast will removed. You've got to adjust your scope. So I, you know, I'll spend a lot of time when you're working in a small opening when I'm doing a discectomy. You've got to constantly jockey the scope around to be able to see the correct corridor. So when I'm decompressing, I'll have it in one position, but I want to come in to take that disc fragment out. Um, I will bring it into a new position to make sure I can see the lateral edge of the dura, see the traversing route. This is the suction retraction of the dura. That's one way to do it. I generally try not to suction the dura away. I try to just lift it out of the way with a pin field and then a dural retractor. This is a disc fragment. This is typically what you're going to see in your laminotomy defect when you're doing a microdisc. Um, so um, th this is a good visualization because you've got good bleeding control. You've got great visualization of the lateral edge of your dural sac and your traversing neural structure. And then you can make sure you're safely working uh, to, um, to do this. Um, get, get, please give the, the nerve, uh, treat it gently. Uh, prolonged retraction, excessive retraction could create its own uh, neurologic injury. So I will tend to give the neural structure some frequent breaks. I'll work for a while, then I'll stop and give the nerve some time to rest. Um, and one of my key um, attendants on this is if, if you can't see it, don't bite it, don't pull it. Make sure you can visualize the dura, visualize the nerve. Uh, if it looks, if it, you can't visualize and it doesn't really look like a, um, a piece of disc or you're not completely sure, remobilize, re-explore, re-retract, because you just don't, don't, definitely don't want to be pulling out a nerve root as a part of the process if you can avoid it. And I talk about the blunt dissection in the epidural space. I'll use a cotenoid. Uh, I'll put some uh, surgery flow in there, get some hemostasis. I'll use the cotenoid as a blunt dissector with a um, some fine, uh, uh, you know, so the, basically the uh, using it to kind of push uh, the the neural structures and the soft tissues out of the way, and the pen field and a small curette. So uh, this those are the techniques when you're doing decompression around the nerves, whether it's a synovial cyst or a disc. It's basically the same thing. We'll talk a little bit about uh, far lateral or intraforaminal pathology, which is a little different. Um, you got it when you're doing a far lateral decompression, and, and I, I put the picture of the, the where the tube would go. Essentially, this is your visual corridor. So whether it's a tube or a retractor, when you're doing decompression out in the neural foramen, and there's nothing in the the spinal canal itself, you've got to get out lateral to the spinal canal. You need to different have a different corridor. And so this is the bony uh, visual corridor that you're coming out lateral. You're working out uh, the, the, the inner transverse membrane is here. Um, you're going to start your bone removal and your ligament removal to get out lateral to the exiting foramen, lateral to the facet and the pars articularis. And for me, when I do this, I make it a principle to see the pars, to see the inferior facet. I like to see the inferior edge of the transverse process of the level above. So if I'm doing L3-4, for example, I want to see the transverse process, the inferior edge of three. I will actually, I tend to use a slightly larger uh, opening than the tube would because I want to see the top of the inferior transverse process as well. So I want to see the top of L4 because that defines the exiting foramen pathway for me. I know all my anatomy at this point. I've got my bony anatomy identified. I've, and now I know basically the disc is going to be sitting down here. Here, the root should be sitting up in here, and I'm going to work from the, in, the superior edge of the inferior articular process and work up. I do remove a small amount of the, the uh, facet joint laterally. I'll remove a small amount of the pars if I need to to make sure I can visualize enough medially. I separate the intertransverse membrane off of the inferior or the superior edge of the inferior articular process, lift it up, and then I work in that place. Let me go back there. Hold on. The, just remember, when you're doing a far lateral decompression, um, the basically you're basically it's probably easier if you don't come direct midline. You can use gen, typically a paramedian approach, about three centimeters to four centimeters uh, off the midline, typically just over the facet joint to get this corridor to come in to be able to see. This is an ideal way to visualize, and there's several retractors that you can use, and then uh, some. Some of you guys use tubes. It's all fine. There's no right or wrong answer for the actual uh, corridor you're creating. Uh, you just want to be able to make sure you see what you what you need to see. Once again, we're back to safe visualization. In this case, you're going to be identifying the exiting nerve root if you can. Typically, there's some deformity of that. If there's a big disc herniation in the exiting foramen, you've got to carefully visualize the inferior edge of your uh, exiting nerve root so you can retract up. 
the dorsal root ganglion's right there, so doing a lot of retraction on it and manipulation on it can cause some dysesthetic pain post-op. So again, be gentle with that. And if you do a ton of cautery around it, you also can create some dysesthetic changes in the nerve. So again, it's a it's a it's a fairly complex approach because you've got to really worry about that exiting nerve and protect it. Uh, but if you remember that the disc space is directly above your pedicle of the inferior vertebral body that gives you your safe window your safe place and I, that's how i do it i find my disc space and then i work up from there fragments are tucked up under the exiting nerve sometimes they're really far lateral and you've got to gently just look and visualize and tease with your your neural structure your uh, blood um, pen field and blood nerve hook to get these fragments out of there and sometimes they're very satisfying you pull out one big chunk and you're done but that's a typical thing. And then for doing just a foramenal decompression out here, again, the bony decompression becomes more important. If you're just gonna ram anatomy to make room for the nerve itself, it's not offending disc material. Now, now you've got to do that visualization of the bony structures, really remove just a little bit of the medial or the lateral pars. And then usually the fending structure in that case is the superior articular process of the inferior vertebra. And you're gonna come at it laterally and basically remove it. And this is a typical demonstration of what's removed. This is a disc herniation but this is your decompressive window. This is what you're removing from a bony structural standpoint because you've got to decompress that exiting nerve. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, the, the bilateral decompression via unilateral approach. Uh, you've got to plan that pre-op. You've got to kind of know that's what you're going to do. You should be looking at your MRI and CT anatomy. Uh, if that's the plan, uh, you've got to make sure you have the appropriate way to get it. It generally takes a slightly longer incision because you've got to really direct your access corridor uh, across the midline. So you've got to be able to get your scope. Sometimes you have to bring your scope way lateral to see across. Um, you might sometimes will have to remove additional spinous process so that you can get underneath. Here you're leaving your link and flavum in place because you're using it to protect the underlying neural structures while you're bringing the burr across. It's really difficult to get this contralateral facet joint, so you got to be super thoughtful and careful. I'll, I'll use a straight curette. Sometimes I can use the straight curette to get underneath here to feel that that plane and create that plane before I take it either with the burr or the kerosene. Um, but you need that ligamentum flavum that comes out last because you need it to protect you as it come across. I think it's best at the upper lumbar level. So if I go L23, I will use this technique because it really helps preserve that contralateral facet so your risk of iatrogenic instability becomes much lower because if you just look at the way you're doing it you've taken a ton of the facet here to get in like you would do typically but here you can leave a ton of the facet and still get the decompression you need um so i think it's easier to do at the other upper lumbar levels because the facets are more um uh, uh vertically uh, uh and and there, there's a narrow in the lamer space there's a narrower uh, uh, uh laminar uh, width and you, your facets are more vertical, and so you can basically preserve more of the normal facets. So that's doable as well. Very helpful with microscope, and this is kind of what you're shooting for when you're done that upper right picture. Cervical foraminotomy is my last uh, kind of decompressive talk here. Uh, most decompressions are done from the front in the cervical spine because of, in, because of the anatomy, because you really can't retract the spinal cord, but cervical disc herniations are fairly common, and, and you can do a posterior decompression, do it well, and get good relief of symptoms uh, with posterior uh, decompression. Uh, the keyhole foraminotomy is kind of the technique. It's very similar to the lumbar decompression, but you're not working very immediately. Uh, you're going to ba basically find the um, uh, interlaminar space, um, and then you're going to work out uh, laterally along the uh, um, facet joint. Uh, you got to remove enough of the lamina here inferiorly to see the exiting root. The disc space is generally right below you. And this is a, a typical decompression that you're going to get in the cervical spine. Same techniques, the burr, the, you're going to use smaller tools, the micro kerosens, uh, the micro curettes to work out. Um, and uh, if you need access to the disc pathology, you can gently retract the exiting nerve root up and work underneath it to get disc fragments out. You cannot work medially here because you can't retract the cord. Um, so it's it's limited in, in, in what you can do with the foraminotomy in the cervical spine, but it is a doable surgery. And this is a typical approach uh, from the from a skin incision. So sometimes it does require a little bit larger skin incision. If you're going to do it with an open technique, uh, the tubes are really nice here because you don't need to make as near as big of a um, uh, incision to put a, do a tubular approach. You do have to localize if you're going to do that. You have to drop uh, dilators down 
And so it's sometimes hard to see the exact level on a lateral fluoro, depending on the patient's anatomy, if they have large shoulders, if they're really big patients, it, it can make visualization hard. Um, and so sometimes you have to do a big enough incision so you can just make sure you're at the right level for decompression, back to the idea of don't operate until you know you're at the right level. This becomes key in the cervical spine as well because of the positioning to do a posterior decompression. Uh, and, and you're doing trying to do a very limited approach. So we talk about um, some of the discussion here. Um, uh, by the idea of do the different uh, ways to do decompression, the effectiveness of posterior decompression techniques compared to the conventional laminectomy. I think the studies, basically this study was looking at laminotomies versus laminectomy, and there was um, good clinical results with bilateral laminotomies uh, rather than full laminectomy for treating spinal stenosis uh, in this study. And I think that's all I've got for this talk. So I, I think that's all I have. Questions? Or did I put everybody to sleep? Thanks, Prof. That was awesome. Anybody got any pearls of their own? I was very lose everybody. Jamie. Thank you very much. Hey, you, uh, Gamber, you guys have any? You guys have any questions? Is it Camber or Jamber? Oh, good lord! I think it's Camber. <laughs> what they decided on. <laughs> I don't know that we decided on anything specifically. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's literally. It's literally what the group chat's called in my phone. <laughs> yes, oh, yes, that is what was decided upon. Um, no, thanks, Dr. Brophy. That was awesome. Sure. Yeah, it's, it's for me, guys. I think you know we talk a lot about various things and what we do, and there's a technical nuance to doing decompression surgery that I think I think it's as hard as anything we do um, to do it well. And to do it with minimal complication and uh when you get a complication from a decompression it can become very frustrating because it's 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 something you got to follow a, a dural injury seems relatively benign until the patient you realize the patient has a much higher risk of getting a post-op wound infection having ongoing symptoms or requiring a need to return to the operating room so techniques that can help you avoid complications and still do a good job taking care of the pathology i think are critical and unfortunately, a lot of what I present and what I talk about is because I've learned it because I didn't do it that way <laughs> and and suffered. Yeah, so 